Good morning, it's Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and in Senya Booksellers and here I am with World History again. Uh, the weeks go by very quickly. World History by Tom Padula live on Facebook, program number 50, half a century, not bad. So uh, it's, uh, it's interesting how time flies uh, and uh, so do the years of history, going back to, you know, a million years ago. It's incredible. Well, this uh, Lesson 50 uh, presentation, podcast, all of those are available for you to use when referring to what I do. And uh, it's, it's really quite a milestone here, uh, having reached uh, the Middle Ages. And the Middle Ages of course, belongs to the church. Yes, today we're going to cover the church, the importance of the church in the Middle Ages. Don't forget that um, the Roman Empire fell and um, then there was, um, then there was uh, a period of called the Dark Ages. I don't know whether they were dark, but... Uh, in terms of um, you know the fall of the Roman Empire, it had a lot of uh, it had a lot of uh, influence on the way uh, people lived in Europe, especially. Uh, uh, welcome to Assunta Lombardi. Thank you for coming on. Uh, so the church is a very important institution by the twelfth century, eleventh, twelfth century. That's when we start getting into the Middle Ages. In other words, the, the Dark Ages are sort of behind us and people are getting used to, you know, the barbarians. Uh, the, in Europe, they, there's, there's a lot of movement from north to south and vice versa. And uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, people start to calm down a little bit. Not in the sense that they weren't violent, but that they understood that there was um, uh, there was a need to live in uh, in peace. You can't always fight each other, and I think that was the general conclusion. Whether uh, and then you're looking at um, what's going to happen next. For example, with the you know with the advent of uh, Muhammad and Islam, and the effect it had on. Uh, on the Middle East, the North Africa, Europe, and the other way as well, uh, Turkey, and going into Greece. And yeah, things really moved on. Then I'm going to continue with China. China is interesting, uh, another interesting uh, uh, area to look at because of its dynasties, the empires that it created, but, and also, I was looking up the Silk Road. This is the, the era of Marco Polo, you know, that sort of a era, uh, the Silk Road and the trade that, that had been going on since the Roman times because the Romans uh, and um, China knew about each other. Not many people, but there were the Silk Roads, roads because it wasn't just one single road, there were also some other roads. So... If you like documentaries, you can look them up on um, uh, on YouTube, uh, you know, in your own home, if you have the facilities. So that, that's it. Then we're going to go to America once again, and we look at um, where the populations came from, and they, they called them the human genome. You know, in other words, uh, how do you know? How do you know? Uh, through study of data uh, from, you know, from skeletons uh, that people have discovered. Uh, of course, before the invasion, we, we, we sort of left behind now men and, and women. Uh, we're going to look at health and medicine uh, during the time before what we call the invasion, 1788, what happened before, uh, with, for hundreds of years, centuries, in fact, uh, millennia. How did the local people, the indigenous people of Australia, looked at their own health and, um, you know, how, uh, 
health was important. How do you, you know, if you have a cut, what do you do with it? If you get a fever, you know, how did they handle it? Uh, and then, of course, Banjo Patterson and Henry Lawson come to mind. And uh, I have a, a beautiful poem today from Henry Lawson called uh, called The Republic. <laughs> it's about the Republic. Written in 1887. Can you believe that? They were already talking about the Republic then. Okay. And then, of course, my trip to Darwin first, through Catherine, through Broome, uh, and all the you know, pine. There are a lot of uh, areas that I've visited and uh, I'm going to show you today. I think it's uh, the turn of um, Catherine South, Pine Creek, Catherine South, uh, and then we get to a river. Okay, that's about it. It's 11.30 and I'm going to start. But before I start, what do we do? <coughs> Cheers. Okay, let's go. The Church. Importance of the Church in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, there were three great classes of people. Besides the noblemen and their followers who did the fighting, the peasants who did the work of producing food, there were the churchmen who prayed, taught and attended to the sick. Social services. Travellers in Western Europe still admire the great monasteries and cathedrals which remind us of the enormous influence of the church in medieval times. So they weren't just, you know, helping other people. They're also builders of monasteries and churches. You know, they, they well, it was a class of people apart. Care of the sick, education and entertainment. In those days, there were no hospitals and no schools such as we know today. So that's true. The, the, every the education was handled by tutors, if you could afford one. And there were no theatres, no moving pictures, no wireless sets and very few books and definitely no computers and no tablets uh, and no iPads, etc., etc. Instead, there was the church, which provided such care for the sick and such education and entertainment as there, were, there was far for the greater majority of people, the serfs and the peasants. So these people couldn't afford things, and uh, so the churchmen were very close to the noblemen in some ways, and they asked for their, you know, a lot of them left them money and gave them help whenever needed, etc., etc., Little medical knowledge. Although some monks and priests were greedy men who cared only for their own power of, or pleasures, there were always some, too, who tried unselfishly to help the poor as Jesus had taught. So uh, in the groups of people, there's always good and bad, including amongst the, the priests and brothers and nuns, well, at the time, I'm not sure about the nuns, whether they came later, because basically we're always talking about the men's world here. And the women were of secondary uh, nature to, you know, to be written about, except then, uh, you know, the, the, they sort of looked at women uh, in very idolised ways, which was a good thing. But, you know, people are people. In most monasteries, there was a monk who knew how to bleed a sick person and how to make salves and ointments from herbs and other ingredients. These remedies may often have been worse than the diseases they were supposed to cure but they were probably less harmful than the prescriptions of old village women who often became known as witches. So the witches, one of the big jobs of the witches was to cure people. They gave you the potions. Uh, unbelievable. So then the monks did some of the work. Then you compare. 
Interesting. Religious plays, monastery schools. On feast days, the priests often performed religious plays for the people on the, on the church steps. And in most monasteries, a few boys learned at least how to read and write some Latin, besides their own language. Many monasteries also provided travellers with food and lodgings. St Francis of Assisi Often in the Middle Ages, when it seemed that far too many churchmen were becoming proud and rich, the life of a really saintly man would remind them again of their duty. Such a man was St Francis, who was born in the little Italian town of Assisi in 1182, 1182. Since his parents were rich, his early life was, was of ease and pleasure. But like the great Indian thinker, Gautama, he could not forget the miseries of others. When he was about 25 years old, he gave away all his wealth and went about preaching the gospel. Welcome to Angela Imola. So St Francis of Assisi was from a rich family. But the story goes that his father... Uh, sort of expected him to to follow suit, you know, with what he was doing, <clears throat> and um, didn't succeed. The father. In fact, Saint Francis gave away all his clothes to him and said, "He keep them. I don't need them." And look what he's got now. St. Francis of Assisi. It's the Franciscan order of priests that's gone on for centuries. They own monasteries. They own, but, uh, you know, it's when you give away everything, you've got everything. It's hard to do. The Grey Friars. So loving and gentle was St. Francis that it is said even the wild birds and beasts of the forest came to listen to his preaching. Welcome to Antonio Danzi. And I have some um, poems about St. Francis of Assisi and I will read them to you one day. Many men impressed by his unselfishness and sincerity became his followers and founded an order of friars or brothers who vowed to spend their lives serving God and their fellow men, as Francis had done. If true to their vows, the Franciscans had to work for their living. And though they might beg for food if hungry, they might never beg for money. In the course of time, they became known as the Grey Friars, because of the grey gowns tied at the waist with a rope, which they wore everywhere. I don't know whether they've seen a Franciscan brother. They've got the court, you know, they, 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 their robes are no longer grey. It's more, more uh, brownish, you know, more on the dark side of brown. And then there was another order called the Dominicans. There were several other orders of friars whose members vowed to live really Christian lives and they lived in communities. The best known after the Franciscans were perhaps the Black Friars or Dominicans, whose order was founded by the Spanish monk, St. Dominic. By no means all the friars lived up to the example of the saintly men who founded the orders, but many a wretched villain must have been thankful for the help and comfort given by the friars in times of trouble. So they, they played a, a really big social role in the lower classes of people during the Middle Ages. We're going to stop there uh, for this week. So I've got a lot to do. I've got China to cover now. And uh, we'll continue next week. The, the bit about the church will be finished. Let's go to China now. And this is an interesting one. Again, uh, you know, China's had a very big and great civilization. Welcome to Frank Matsaka. Uh, China needs to be studied, uh, and uh, we're lucky to, to have, um, uh, you know, platforms like, like Netflix and, 
and also our television stations in general, they occasionally have some um, some good films about, uh, you know, for example, Marco Polo and studies the documentaries. And I was watching one last night. You know, I'm very attracted to these things, but, you know, are you? That's the question. Okay, Sun Quan rules the roost in Zhengdong province, in Zhengdong. Sun Quan was born in 182 after Christ or, and, two, and died in 252. So he was 70 years old when he died. Was born in today's Zhejiang province and named himself Zongmu. After his elder brother Sun Che, Che's death, he took over his rule over the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River, all that area there. At that time, there were people who looked down on him and rebelled publicly against him. Sun Quan dispatched troops quickly and killed the rebels. They didn't play around. Seeing he was so courageous and resourceful, people all admired him very much. They got scared. <laughs> Later, Cao Cao proposed that as long as Sun Quan sent one of his sons to Cao Cao as hostage, Cao Cao would promise to keep good relations with Sun Quan. Adopting Zhu's use advice, Sun Quan did not listen to Cao Cao's proposal. Instead, he developed and expanded his own power, relying on the geographical advantages in Zhendong, roughly, the areas south of the Yangtze River, which finally led to the situation of a tripartite confrontation. So eventually they, they fought. And that's what we're going to look at today. Sun Quan, Cao Cao, and uh, well, the other one is Bai. What's his name? Hu Bai. Anyway, let me read it. The Battle, the battle of the Red Cliff, it's called. After Cao Cao united North China, he had only two rivals, Sun Quan in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River and Liu Bei in what is now the area of Hubei province. In 2008, after Christ, Cao Cao led an army of 200,000 men, claimed to be 800,000 men. He claimed 800,000. In fact, there were only two, a quarter of, of that, 200,000 which is quite considerable still. And welcome to Antonio Danzi and Frank Mazzacca. Liu Bei retreated to Wuchang, Hubei. At that time, he only had an army of about 20,000 men. Based on the military strategist Zhu Liang's suggestion, he decided to make an alliance with Sun Quan to fight together against Cao Cao. Zhu Liang argued that before Sun Quan that although Cao Cao outstripped them in the quantity of the army, about 70,000 to 80,000 of his men were soldiers surrendered from, surrendered, surrendered from Jingzhu. So in other words, they'd given up because they didn't want to fight, so they joined his army, Cao Cao's army. These people were mainly Navy soldiers and were the operational main force and they had no certain loyalty to Cao Cao. Furthermore, the northern soldiers were not good at battle on the water, and many fell into a bad illness after their long-distance advance. This analysis caused Sun Quan to clearly see the situation, and he agreed to send his senior general, Zhu Yu, to lead 30,000 sergeants to fight against Cao Cao together with Liu Bei. Cao Cao ordered a place called the Red Cliff in today's Chibi or Kibi city, Hubei province. Although it has been alternatively located in the northeast of today's Xiaowu, Xiaoyu County in Hubei, he climbed the ships together so that the northern soldiers could walk steadily on them. It's pretty smart. He chained the, the 
he chained the the, uh, the actual ships so they could walk from one to the other. Both Zhu Giliang and Zhu Yu decided to attack Cao Cao with fire. One night when there was a favorable sou southeastern wind, Zhu Yu dispatched the general, one guy with ten ships, to sail towards the enemy, pretending to be surrounding. The ships were loaded with firewood, soaked in oil. When they were near enough to Cao Cao's fleet, they set their ships on fire and left them to drift into the enemy ships. Because Cao Cao's ships were chained together and were hard to untie in such a short time, Cao Cao's fleet was immediately caught in a sea of fire. Later, the fire expanded to the land and Cao Cao's troops were severely destroyed. Not bad, that's, you know, using the brains. After the Battle of the Red Cliff, the situation of China changed. Cao Cao retreated back to the north. In 2020, after Cao Cao's death, his son Cao Pi dethroned the Emperor Xiandi of the Han Dynasty and proclaimed himself Emperor, renaming his territory Wei with Luoyang as its capital. As his capital. Following his, this victory in the Battle of the Red Cliff, Liu Bei occupied most of Jingzhou and then spread his power to the west in, two, in tw 221. He also proclaimed himself emperor and named his state Shu with the capital in Shengdu, Shengdu Sichuan province. Sun Quan consolidated his power in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River and proclaimed himself emperor in 2022. He named his state Wu and made Zhangye, today's Nanjing, his capital. The situation of tripartite confrontation lasted only 280, lasted until 280, when the Western Jin dynasty wiped out Wu. That's interesting, isn't it? Three sides, you know, two sides get together, then they fight the third side and destroy him, and they fight amongst themselves. Well, wow. I'm watching the the uh, the empire of Qi at the moment. Uh, very interesting. Again, you know, you got to get into it in order to learn about it. So when you're doing world history, one of the great things is that you can actually, uh, in today's world, you can do a, a sort of a, a study of both, you know, Europe and China to see East and West in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and then also, you know, the Middle East sort of thing, Turkey and the Middle East up to India. That's another one. You can come... You can go north, you can come south. So in the north, there was the Mongol Empire that followed. That's when around, you know, you, the Silk Road became more well uh, well used. It's uh, interesting. Source population of North America. There's general agreement among the anthropologists that the source populations of, for migration into the Americas originated from an area somewhere east of the Yenisei River, that's Russian Far East. The common occurrence of the mtDNA op aplo groups, A, B, C and D, among Eastern nation and Native American population has long been recognised. So along with the presence of aplo group X, as a whole, the greatest frequent frequency of the four Native American association associated APRA groups occurs in the Alta Baikal region of southern si Siberia. Some subclades of C and D closer to the Native American subclades occur among the Mongolian, Amur, Japanese, Korean, and Anju people, uh, people populations. In a 2019 study suggested that the Native Americans are the closest living relatives to 10,000-year-old fossils found near Col Colima River, 
uh, in northern and eastern Siberia. You know, th these are the studies that people do. Human genomic models. The development of high-resolution genomic analysis has provided opportunities to further define Native American subclades and, and narrow the range of Asian subclades that may be parent or sister subclades. For example, the broad geographic area of April Group X has been inter interpreted as allowing the possibility of a Western Asian or even a European source population for Native Americans, as in the Salutran hypothesis, or suggesting a pre-last glacial maximum migration into, into the Americas. The analysis of an ancient variant of Apple Group X among Aboriginals of the Altai region indicates common sense ancestry with the, um, with the European strain rather than this descent from the European strain. Further division of X subclades has also allowed identification of subgroup XA, which is regarded as specific to Native Americans, which further defines with further definition of subclades related to Native Native American populations, the requirement for sampling Asian populations to find the most closely uh, related subclades group grow more specific. Uh, you know, these are technical names, you know. Subplow groups D1 and D4 have been regarded as Native American specific based on their absence among a large sampling of population regarded as potentially descendants of source populations over a wide area of Asia among the 3,764 the 3, samples. The Sakhalin, Sakhalin Lower Amur region was represented by 61 Orox. In another study, some groups, the uh, in another study, sub sub pro group D1A has been identified among the Ulches of the Lower Amur River region, along with the sub group C1. Sub group C1 is regarded as a closer sister clade of the Native Americans. Subgroups C and C. So, in other words, what happens here is that um, you know you're trying to do a study of where the populations come from uh, by comparing uh, the you know the, the northern Asian populations specific details and the North American ones. I don't know. I mean. They're actually trying to get the various areas uh, where these things, you know, where this has occurred. Anyway, let's go on. Sub-bar pro group D1A has been also found among ants in the Jomon skeletons from Hokkaido. So this, we're talking about Japan here. The modern Ainu were, are regarded as the descendants of the Jomon. The currents of the subgroups D1A and C1A in the lower Amur regions suggest a source population from that region distinct, distinct from the Altai Baikal source populations, where sampling did not reveal those two particular subclades. The conclusion regarding sub, sub pro group D1 indicates potential source population is in the lower Amur and Hokkaido areas standing in contrast to the single source migration model. And I'll go on from there next time. It's too, too much. Too much, too, too technical, this area. But the, the idea is that the groups, the various groups are compared in today's studies. Okay, so that's, that's that.
health and medicine amongst the population, uh, amongst the population of um, uh, of the Aborigines. And we're talking about somewhere along 150 different groups, ranging from Tasmanian uh, indigenous people to the ones in the Northern Territory and Cape York, right up to the north. Big difference. The Aboriginal, the Aboriginal people lived in harmony with their environment. They had a well-balanced diet, diet and did not suffer from the diseases of people living in large cities and towns. For example, they had almost no tooth decay, probably because they had very few sweet things in their diet. Also, most of their food was hard and tough and needed a lot of chewing. So Aborigines believed that if a person fell sick, he had either done something to offend them, the ancestral beings, or he had wronged and injured another person who had made him sick by sorcery. I think I should really get myself... Oh. It's interesting here. A bit of a study of tooth decay. <laughs> Aborigines, they chewed hard on hard things and they, they didn't have tooth decays. Wow. Okay. Aborigines believed that if a person fell sick, he had either done something to offend the ancestral beings or he had wronged or injured another person who had then made him sick by sorcery. A good way. Welcome to Pietro di Dio. The beliefs of the Europeans in 1788 were much the same, for they believed that God's anger or another person's evil wishes or actions could cause illness. When you do something wrong to others, or, you know, you're anti-God, or, you know, whatever, uh, some people believe, uh, believe that, uh, you know, you get punished. The idea of karma things come back to you in a very physical way. Therefore, one kind of cure the Aborigines had for illness was meant to remove the evil substances put in the patient's body by a sorcerer. You know, the evil eye. The member of each group most skilled in doing this was the doctor, also called the medicine man or the shaman or the clever medicine man. The shaman was a clever medicine, medicine man. They were, all, they were clever women too, of course. The shaman called the community together so that they could all see what he was doing and then he removed some evil substance from the patient's body by massage and sucking. This action and the, and the interest of the whole community helped convince the patient that he would get better. Psychologically, the patient felt, you know, if they are helping me, uh, you know, it's all going to get better. And in fact, they do, did get better. Another cure, especially if the ailment was psychological, was the healing ritual of the women. So they sang and danced a special ceremony around the patient. Sometimes the patient felt badly treated and that nobody cares about me, and this occurs in other societies too. This was the kind of ailment that would be cured by the women's efforts. This was the kind of ailment that would be cured by the women's efforts. Of course, all the adults, particularly the clever men and women, had special medicines and treatments, which would be used in addition to the faith healing of the doctor and of the women. So there's a a part faith and a part medicine from herbs, from herbs, etc. It's a, it's a bit trial and error. So that's what we're going to do today. We're not doing much more for health and medicine. But as, as long as one realises 
that during, you know, that, that the Aborigines didn't have hospitals as such. You know, they, you were sick, you stayed home or whatever. I don't know. But I assume it's very primitive in the sense of, you know, close to the earth. Okay, now we want to talk about Benja Patterson. And we said Benja Patterson was the quintessential uh, Australian male uh, of the late uh, 19th and the early 20th century. He was quite a guy. And this is one of his poems called Malga Bill's Bicycle. Let's go. It was Malga Bill from Eagle Hawk that caught the cycling craze. It, it turned away the good old horse that served, served him many days. He dressed himself in cycling clothes resplendent to be seen. He hurried off to town and bought a shining new machine. And as he wielded through the door with air of lordly pride, the grinning shop assistant said, excuse me, can you ride? See here, young men, said Marka Bill, from Walgett to the sea. From Conroy's Gap to Castlereagh, there's none can ride like me. I'm good all round and everything, as everybody knows. Although I'm not the one to talk, I'm, I'm good or I hate a man that blows, that, you know, builds himself up. But riding is my special gift, my chiefest, chiefest soul delight. Just ask a wild duck, just ask a wild duck can it swim, a wild cat can it fight. There's nothing clothed in the air or hide or built of flesh or steel. There's nothing walks, jumps. There's nothing walks or jumps or runs on axle, hoof or wheel. But what I'll sit while hide will, will hold and girth and straps are tight. I ride this here to wield concern right straight away at sight. Not bad with Marga Bill. Twas Marga Bill from Eagle Hawk that sought his own abode, that perched above the dead man's creek besides the, besides the mountain road. He turned the cycle down the hill and mounted for the fray, but Eve, he had gone, but here he'd gone a dozen yards, it bolted clean away. It left the track and through the trees just like a silver streak. It whistled through the, the awful slope towards the dead man's creek. So it whistled down the awful slope towards the dead man's creek. It shaved a stump by half an inch. It dodged a big white box. It shaved a stump by half an inch. It dodged a big white boy. The very wallaroos in fright went scrambling up the rocks. The wombats hiding in their caves dug deeper underground. A smoker bill as white as chalk set tight, set tight to every bound. He struck a stone and gave a spring that cleared a fallen, a fallen tree. A smogger bill as white as chalk set tight to every bound. He struck a stone and gave a spring that cleared a fallen tree. It raced besides a precipice as close as close could be. And then a smogger bill let out one last despairing shriek. It made a leap of 20 feet into the dead man's creek. Wow. Twas smogger bill from Eagle Hawk. They slowly swam ashore. He said, I've had some narrow shaves, narrow shaves and lively rides below. 
I rode the wild bull around the yard to win a five-pound bet, but this was the most awful ride that I've ever encountered by the net. I'll give the two-wheeled outlaw best. It's shaken all my nerve to feel it whistling through the air and plunge and buck and swerve. It's the safest at rest in dark than... It's safest re at rest in Dead Man's Creek. We live with lying grill. A horse's back is good enough. Uh, a horse's back is good enough. And so forth for Marga Bill. Bill. It's a different, difficult one, this one. Well, he set the rent. Huh? Marga Bill's bicycle, Bill, Bill bicycle. So after the, the race, he, what did he do? He, he sort of gave up on the bicycle. That's the way I read it. But anyway, it needs a bit of study, this one. Okay. And now for Henry Lawson. We'll do this uh, first, you know, this is the, it's called the Bush Undertaker and it's continued. So if you need to, I'm reading the whole lot, but there are many pages, so I do them in stages. There are many pages, so I do them in stages. That sounds like a poem. <laughs> I'll do them. <laughs> there are many pages, so that I do them in stages. I better write that down. Yeah. So what did I say? There are, there are so many pages. So I will do, I'll do them in stages. Good one. I've written it, written it down. That's what you've got to do. That's how poetry is formed. Then the next one, you know, we're talking about history here. Marga Bill went down the hill <laughs> and he left his bicycle, uh, whatever. So Marga Bill went down the hill. See? Marga Bill went down the hill. Okay, let's go. Looking round, his eyes lit up with satisfaction as he saw some waste bits, bits of bark which had been left by a party of strippers who had been getting bark there for the stations. He picked up two pieces, one about four and the other about six feet long, and each about two feet wide, and brought them over to the body. He laid the longest strip by the side of the corpse, which he proceeded to lift onto it. Come on, Brumby, he said in a soft tone, in a softer tone than usual. You ain't as bad as you might be, considering, yes, it must be three good months since you slipped the very wind. <laughs> I spent, I spect it was the rum as preserved, yeah. It was the death of you, of yeah, when you, when you was alive, and now you're dead. It preserves you like a, you, like a mummy. You can tell me what this is all about next time. Then he placed the other strip on top with the hollow side down. I don't know. I was thinking. I was thinking about Benjamin and uh, Benjamin and uh, 
Henry Lawson. They, they got quite away with words. Come on, Brumby said in a softer tone than usual. You ain't as bad as you might be considering as it must be three good months since you slipped your wind. I expect it was the rum as preserved year. It was the death of year when year were, was alive and now you're dead. It preserved you like, like a mummy. Then he placed the other strip on top with the hollow side downwards, thus sandwiching the defunct between the two pieces, removed the saddle strap which he wore for a belt and buckled it round one end while he tried to think of something with which to tie up the other. So he had to carry the body. I can't, I can't take any more strips off my shirt, he said, critically examining the skirts of the old blue over, over shirt he wore. I might get a strip or two more off, but it's short enough already. Let's see how long have I been wearing of that shirt. Oh, I remember I bought it just two days before. A four, five bob was pup, was pupped. I can't afford a new shirt just yet. How some never seeing it brummy, I'll just borrow a couple more strips and sew them on an agent when I get home. And sew them again when I get home. It's written in, uh, in Australian, with a bit of Australian slang in it. He upended Brummy and placing his shoulder against the middle of the lower sheet of bark, lifted the corpse to a horizontal position, then taking the bag of bones as he, he had he, in his hand, he started for home. I ain't a spending sec, sec a dull Christmas after all, he, he reflected as he plodded on, but he had now walked above a hundred years. So I ain't spending sec, sec a dull Christmas after all, he reflected as he plodded on, but he had not walked above a hundred yards when he saw a black goanna sidling into the grass by the side of the path. Welcome to Maria Anna Casino. That's another of them, the Adang, thinks he explained. That's two I've seen this morning. Presently remarked, you don't smell none too sweet, Brummy. It must be just, just about the middle of the shearing when you're pegged out. I wonder who got your last check. Sure, there's another black goanna. Uh, the, mm, there must be a flock of them. He rested Brummy on the ground while he had another pool at the bottle and before going on, packed a bag of bones and his shoulder under the body, but he soon stopped again. So this was his attempt at, at carrying the, the corpse. Oh, well, that's it for today. Uh, yes, I want to spend some time uh, doing, showing you my trip uh, up north. It's getting interesting there too. So let me see if I can get my computer running again. Good. Okay, I'm ready. Now, I was very keen to do this because I've been thinking about I'm not showing enough of my material uh, from my uh, journey up north. And I thought, well, you know, how do I do it? Well, you have to take some time off from the history part and go into the real geography of, of Australia. Here we go. Here we are. Oops. Here we are in Catherine, Catherine Daly, it's called. Okay, so let's go. This is a little river. You know, I film these things as I go along. Look at that. Look at this. That's how the water comes up when it floods in the rainy season. Okay. And that's when it dries up. You got a vegetation, and this is 
railway terminals, Savannah, Stewart Highway, Matarangs, Victoria Highway, Kananara. We are in Kananara. You heard of Kananara? Well, this is a bus. Uh, so we're moving along in the in the town. We see all this, Kananara. Good memory. Keep our territory frack free. No fracking. No fracking. What's going on here? Uh, and that's a nice little space. Beautiful, huh? Australia for you. Uh, look at that. Three, uh, th th one truck carrying three, two other, uh, two other uh, bits there. Look at that, like like toys they are. Yet they do a great job. Okay. Direct fuel hall. There, look at that. Oh, isn't that a beautiful picture? More graffiti here, look at that. This is Catherine South, Catherine Daly. And we had to go down. You know why? Because in Catherine, uh, look at that, turtle on the concrete. There we are. Somebody is in the water. A lot of people. We didn't have enough time, we couldn't go in. Look at that. Ah, doesn't that look delicious, huh? Beautiful. I did wet my hands. <laughs> couple of the people from our bus trip. But if they were there, you couldn't go there, so there you are. There's another the lot. There's a family there, young family. And, of course, myself here for me to remember. There were two, two lots of two ponds. There are with uh, other people from the group, and that was the other pool. You know, spring, spring water. A lot of fun, and we are in Catherine South, Catherine Daly. Nice. More pictures. Another selfie there from you know you have to take the pictures as as you see it. Sometimes you're trying to do different things as well, 
but look, it's nice, nicely organised for tourists. With my sister. And you gotta walk. Walking is the name of the the, the name of the game. Nice, look at that. Nice construction. So if you're ever in Catherine, you can expect to go to see the, the spring. Spring water and have a swim, but you need some time. Time is the essence. And then, of course, here we go. Beautiful graffiti, look at that. This one here. Look at that. On the bus there, I thought yeah, I'd pick up some of the do a bit of the footage of the place. Very Australian. Let me know if you enjoy this sort of, um, you know, views of Australia. Uh, I do my best to... Look at, that's the community, look at that. Nice. Catherine Hotel, identification of the place. Randazzo Senta, <laughs> reminded me of Nino Randazzo, it's, uh, uh, we stopped in Catherine, and went into a shopping centre, have a look. Nicely set up. And of course, that's where we stayed. Yeah, each one had a room, shared room. It was around the place. And that's the pool. There's a pool there, but it was by the time we got, uh, we were cold because we had to get to, uh, to eat. That's the, uh, all set up. Uh -huh. It's all, no tourists, they're in trouble. You need to travel north. <laughs> Go spend some money. <laughs> That's the idea. I tell you what, these places here, they really do need uh, a lot of love, you know, from all of us. And it's great to go there in, uh, in, a, in a dry season between April and October. Say May and October. You get nice weather all the time. Look at the, look at the sky. It was like that all the, all the way.
Some ladies there, including my sister, you know. Uh, of course, I got in as well. This was uh, eating time. And this was the, the manager, I think, of, um, of the cafeteria there, or the hotel, the dining section. Let's have a look. Say something about this place. Uh, this place? In the capital, capital is it? Yes. Right. You're looking at us. We're at Catherine at Knott's Crossing Resort. Fantastic. Uh, got a good setup. Wonderful. That's a short, but it, you know, did the job. And this uh, group of people. And that's what we could select from. Rings. There you are. Look at this. The, when you, with numbers, it's different. You know, it's, uh, I've begun to, it's my first trip really with uh, a group of people in a bus. Generally, I've driven there myself or caught a plane, but uh, this time I decided, yeah, I'm going to try it, try it out. And it works. It's a good system. And that is, uh, where are we? That's still Catherine. But now we go to Catherine Museum. Look at that. What a beautiful area. Now, this is Nitmiluk National Park. This is the day after. Okay, this is very interesting, this Nitmiluk. There you are, Nitmiluk National Park. Believe you me, to take all this footage is they requires a lot of hard work. <laughs> ah, look at that. Guron, hot and humid. Jungalk, Malapar, Ziyok, Bangkarang. Jalkawarak Trail. Yeah. Interesting. Barawai Loop and Southern Walks and Trails. Plenty of information. Ah, this was, uh, this, believe it or not, was the toilet. Mungui. Mungui for male. Guess what's for female? Galmuka. Galmuka, female. There you are. A bit of uh, our indigenous uh, languages coming to play. Why not? Use them for toilets. Galmuka. And what was the other one? You remember? Do you remember the other one? Mungai. Up. Mungai. What am I doing? Come on. That's it. Oh, gosh. Oh, I can't get to the next lot. Here we go. This was the Mungai. Where to stop. Nitmiluk Vista Safety. Stay hydrated. Now this, we took a boat here. And that's what it looks. And it was the, the line. We thought we weren't going to go on it for a little while, etc., etc. But then it all worked out. You know, things happened. There you are. My, my knit me look self. <laughs> Both tours, canoe hire. 
we have to book beforehand if you want to get there and view things. So when someone else does it for you, how happy are you? There's this, that's happiness. And this is the beginning of the tour. Now, it's, um, what is the time now? 11.29. We're going to stop there, and next time we'll start from here. Okay? So that's it for now. I'd love to know whether you are interested in watching this. I think, um, you know, doing uh, the tours like this and then showing the places, okay, but it really gives you encouragement to move around. Uh, if anyone is interested, you can contact me as well and I'll, uh, I'll pass you. You know, I'll, I'll give you the information uh, of the person who organises it. All right, so that's it. Come and see me at uh, Insegna uh, sometimes and ask me all the questions you want about all the activities that, uh, you know, I'm involved in, including, for example, this coming Sunday I'll be at Federazione Lugana for Languages and Cultures. Uh, meeting with Coro all'improvviso, the choir, you know, improvised choir, ad hoc choir. And then uh, we also have on the 25th, because I missed out on, uh, because I went to Adelaide on the weekend, I missed out on doing the Dante, uh, Dante lesson podcast. Then, I th and also going in the afternoon to the Coro all'improvviso. We decided to do it on the, this coming Sunday, the first week of October. And then I'll do one more on the, I think it's the 20, 25th, uh, the last Sunday, no, the second last Sunday of October, because the last Sunday they have a dinner dance. So, you know, you have to be flexible. So if you want to know anything about the activities, contact me and uh, we'll... Uh, We'll see what I can do. Uh, you know, I can always have a little chat on the phone, give you the right information. And especially, even if you, you know, have a good network with people who sell houses, people who go on tours and uh, other things. So on that note, I'm very happy to say that another one of my presentation is over. And uh, this is Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and in Senior Booksellers. Until next time, next Thursday, all going well. Ciao.